Letter Three to Rufinus the Monk by St. Jerome Written from Antioch, 374 A.D. to Rufinus in Egypt That God gives more than we ask Him for, and that He often grants us things which eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have they entered into the heart of man, I knew indeed before from the mystic declaration of the sacred volumes. But now, dearest Rufinus, I have had proof of it in my own case. For I, who fancied it too bold a wish to be allowed by an exchange of letters to counterfeit to myself your presence in the flesh, hear that you are penetrating the remotest parts of Egypt, visiting the monks, and going round God's family upon earth. Oh, if only the Lord Jesus Christ would suddenly transport me to you, as Philip was transported to the eunuch, and Habakkuk to Daniel. With what a close embrace would I clasp your neck! How fondly would I press kisses upon that mouth which is so often joined with me of old in error or in wisdom! But I am unworthy, not that you should so come to me, but that I should so come to you. And, because my poor body, weak even when well, has been shattered by frequent illnesses, I send this letter to meet you instead of coming myself, in the hope that it may bring you hither to me, caught in the meshes of love's net. My first joy at such unexpected good tidings was due to our brother Heliodorus. I desired to be sure of it, but did not dare to feel sure especially as he told me he'd only heard it from someone else, and as the strangeness of the news impaired the credit of the story. Once more my wishes hovered in uncertainty, and my mind wavered, till an Alexandrian monk, who had some time previously been sent over by the dutiful zeal of the people to the Egyptian confessors, in will already martyrs, impelled me by his presence to believe the tidings. Even then, I must admit, I still hesitated. For on the one hand, he knew nothing, either of your name or country. Yet, on the other, what he said seemed likely to be true, agreeing as it did with the hint which had already reached me. At last the truth broke upon me in all its fullness, for a constant stream of persons passing through brought the report, Rufinus is at Nitria, and has reached the abode of the blessed Macarius. At this point I cast away all that restrained my belief, and then first really grieved to find myself ill. Had it not been that my wasted and enfeebled frame fettered my movements, neither the summer heat nor the dangerous voyage should have had power to retard the rapid steps of affection. Believe me, brother, I look forward to seeing you more than the storm-tossed mariner looks for his haven, more than the thirsty fields long for showers, more than the anxious mother sitting on the curving shore expects her son. After that sudden whirlwind, dragged me from your side, severing with its impious wrench the bonds of affection in which we were knit together. The dark blue rain-cloud lowered over my head. On all sides were the seas, on all the sky. I wandered about, uncertain where to go. Thrace, Pontus, Bithynia, the whole of Galatia and Cappadocia, Cilicia also with its burning heat, one after another shattered my energies. At last Syria presented itself to me as a most secure harbor to a shipwrecked man. Here, after undergoing every possible kind of sickness, I lost one of my two eyes. For innocent, the half of my soul was taken away from me by a sudden attack of fever. The one eye which I now enjoy, and which is all in all to me, is our Evagrius, upon whom I, with my constant infirmities, have come as an additional burden. 
we had with us also Hylas, the servant of the holy Melanium, who, by his stainless conduct, had wiped out the taint of his previous servitude. His death opened afresh the wound which had not yet healed. But, as the apostles' words forbid us to mourn for those who sleep, and as my excess of grief has been tempered by the joyful news that has since come to me, I recount this last that, if you have not heard it, you may learn it, and that, if you know it already, you may rejoice over it with me. Benosis, your friend, or, to speak more truly, mine as well as yours, is now climbing the ladder foreshown in Jacob's dream. He is bearing his cross, neither taking thought for the morrow, nor looking back at what he has left. He is sowing in tears that he may reap in joy. As Moses in a type, so he, in reality, is lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. This is a true story, and it may well put to shame the lying marvels described by Greek and Roman pens. For here you have a youth educated with us in the refining accomplishments of the world, with abundance of wealth, and in rank inferior to none of his associates. Yet he forsakes his mother, his sisters, and his dearly loved brother, and settles, like a new tiller of Eden, on a dangerous island with the sea roaring round its reefs while its rough crags, bare rocks, and desolate aspect make it more terrible still. No peasant or monk is to be found there. Even the little Anesimus you know of, in whose kisses he used to rejoice as in those of a brother, in this tremendous solitude, no longer remains at his side. Alone upon the island, or rather not alone, for Christ is with him, he sees the glory of God, which even the apostles saw not, save in the desert. He beholds, it is true, no embattled towns, but he has enrolled his name in the new city. Garments of sackcloth disfigure his limbs, yet so clad he will be the sooner caught up to meet Christ in the clouds. No watercourse pleasant to the view supplies his wants, but from the Lord's side he drinks the water of life. Place all this before your eyes, dear friend, and with all the faculties of your mind, picture to yourself the scene. When you realize the effort of the fighter, then you will be able to praise his victory. Round the entire island roars the frenzied sea while the beetling crags along its winding shores resound as the billows beat against them. No grass makes the ground green. There are no shady copses and no fertile fields. Precipitous cliffs surround his dreadful abode as if it were a prison. But he, careless, fearless, and armed from head to foot with the apostle's armor, now listens to God by reading the scriptures, now speaks to God as he prays to the Lord. And it may be that while he lingers in the island, he sees such some vision such as that once seen by John. What snares, think you, is the devil now weaving? What stratagems is he preparing? Perchance, mindful of his old trick, he will try to tempt Bonosus with hunger. But he has been answered already. Man shall not live by bread alone. Perchance he will lay before him wealth and fame. But it shall be said to him, They that desire to be rich fall into a trap and temptations. For me all glorying is in Christ. He will come, it may be, when the limbs are weary with fasting and rack them with the pangs of disease. But the cry of the apostle will repel him. When I am weak, then I am strong, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
you will hold out threats of death, but the reply will be, I desire to depart and to be with Christ. He will brandish his fiery darts, but they will be received on the shield of faith. In a word, Satan will assail him, but Christ will defend. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus, that in your day I have one able to pray to you for me. To you all hearts are open. Thou searchest the secrets of the heart. You see the prophet shut up in the fish's belly in the midst of the sea. You know, then, how he and I grew up together from tender infancy to vigorous manhood, how we were fostered in the bosoms of the same nurses and carried in the arms of the same bearers, and how, after studying together at Rome, we lodged in the same house and shared the same food by the half-savage banks of the Rhine. You know, too, that it was I who first began to seek to serve you. Remember, I beseech you, that this warrior of yours was once a raw recruit with me. I have before me the declaration of your majesty. Whoever shall teach and not do shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. May he enjoy the crown of virtue, and in return for his daily martyrdoms, may he follow the lamb robed in white raiment. In four in my father's house are many mansions, and one star differs from another star in glory. Give me strength to raise my head to a level with the saints' heels. I willed, but he performed. Do thou therefore pardon me that I failed to keep my resolve, and reward him with the guerdon of his deserts. I may perhaps have been tedious, and have said more than the short compass of a letter usually allows, but this, I find, is always the case with me, when I have to say anything in praise of our dear Bonosus. However, to return to the point from which I set out, I beseech you, do not let me pass wholly out of sight and out of mind. A friend is long sought, hard found, and with difficulty kept. Let those who will allow gold to dazzle them, and be borne along in splendor, their very baggage glittering with gold and silver. Love is not to be purchased, and affection has no price. The friendship which can cease has never been real. Farewell in Christ. End of Letter 3 Letter 7 To Chromatius, Jovinus, and Eusebius By St. Jerome this letter, written in A.D. 374, to three young friends, who all later became bishops, from the desert of Chalcis, where Jerome then was living, gives some details of the writer's sister, whose name is unknown, and of the condition of the church in Dalmatia. Those whom mutual love has joined together ought not to be separated on a written page. Therefore I must not divide between you individually the words that I owe to you all. Two of you, as brothers, are already natural partners, but so strong is the love which you feel for one another that affection unites the three in a bond that is equally close. Indeed, if actual conditions allowed, I would make one abbreviation include all your names without division. For your letter challenged me to regard you as three in one and one in three. And that letter was handed to me by the saintly Evagrius in that part of the desert which forms a broad boundary line 
between the Syrians and the Saracens, and it filled me with joy a joy surpassing even the exaltation felt at Rome over the victory of Marcellus at Nola, when for the first time after Cannae, Hannibal's proud hosts were defeated. The above-named brother often pays me a visit, and cherishes me in Christ like his own flesh. But he is separated from me by a great distance and his departure always causes me as much regret as his coming has brought me delight. Now, I talk to your letter. I embrace it. It carries on a conversation with me. It is the only thing here which knows Latin. In this place an old man either has to learn a barbarous jargon or else hold his tongue. The handwriting I know so well brings your dear faces before my eyes. And then either I am no longer here or else you are here with me. Believe love when it tells you the truth. As I write this letter, I see you before me. However, I have one complaint to make first. Why is it that with such stretches of sea and land between us you sent me so short a letter? <laughs> Perhaps I deserved it, for, as you say, I did not write first. Paper, I imagine, cannot have failed you, now that Egypt supplies the market. <laughs> Even if some Ptolemy had closed the seas, King Attalus was there to send you skins from Pergamum, and by parchment you could have made up for lack of paper. <laughs> the very word parchment, as it exists today, handed down from generation to generation, reveals its origin. Well, am I to suppose that your messenger was pressed for time? One night is sufficient to write a letter in, however long the letter be. Were you prevented by some urgent business? Nothing has a greater claim on you than affection. Two reasons are left. Either you felt disinclined, or else I was not deserving. I prefer to accuse you of sloth rather than condemn myself as unworthy. Uh, the correction of carelessness is an easier matter than the birth of love. You tell me that Bonosus, like a true son of the fish, makes for watery places. For myself, I am still foul with my ancient stains, and like the basilisk and the scorpion, I seek out any place which is dry. Bonosus, today, treads the serpent's head beneath his heel. I am still food for the creeping monster who, by God's decree, devours the earth. Bonosus can climb to the highest step in the Psalms of Degrees. I am still weeping at the beginning of the ascent, and scarcely know whether it will ever be my lot to say, I lifted up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Bonosus, amid the threatening billows of the world, sits in the safe retreat of his island, the bosom of the church. And perhaps like John he is even now eating God's book. I lie in the tomb of my sins, bound in the chains of iniquity, and wait for the Lord's gospel cry, Jerome, come forth. Bonosus, I say, for according to the prophet all the devil's strength is in the loins, has carried his loincloth across the Euphrates to hide it in a hole of the rock, and after he found it torn he has sung, O Lord, thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast broken my bonds asunder, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. 
As for me, a real Nebuchadnezzar has led me in chains to Babylon, that is, to the babble of a distracted mind. There he has laid upon me the yoke of captivity. There he has fastened an iron ring upon me and bidden me sing one of the songs of Sion. To him I have made reply, the Lord looses the prisoners, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. In fact, to complete this comparison of differences in a simple sentence, I pray for mercy, but Gnosis awaits a crown. My sister is the fruit in Christ of the saintly Julian. He planted, You must water. The Lord will give the increase. Jesus has given her to me as compensation for the wound which the devil inflicted. He has brought her back from death to life. But, as the heathen poet says, for her, all things, though safe in semblance, I do fear. You know yourselves how treacherous is the path of youth, a path where I fell, and which you are now traversing not without fear. At this moment when she is entering upon it, she needs to be supported by all men's encouragement, confirmed by all men's advice. In other words, strengthened by such frequent letters as your saintliness will suggest. Love endures all things, and I therefore beg you to get a letter from Pope Valerian also, so that her courage may be increased. You know that a girl's spirit is often fortified by the thought that her elders are interested in her. As for my own country, it is enslaved to barbarism and men's family god is their belly. People live only for the day, and the richer you are, the more saintly you're held to be. Furthermore, to use a well-worn popular saying, the cover there is worthy of the dish, for Lupicinus is their priest. <sighs> it bears out the proverb, which, as you, Lucilius tells us, made Crassus laugh for the only time in his life. When an ass eats thistles up, his lips have led us like them. I mean that in my country a crippled helmsman steers a leaking ship, a blind man leads the blind into a pit. As the ruler is, so are the ruled. I send my greetings to your mother, who is a mother to us all with the deep respect which you know I feel. She is your close associate in holy life, but she has one advantage over you in that she is the mother of such sons as yourselves. Truly, her womb may be called golden. I salute your sisters also, for they are worthy of universal respect. They have triumphed over sex and the world and now await the bridegroom's coming with their lamps well filled with oil. How happy is the house where dwells a widowed Anna, virgins that are prophetesses, and twin Samuels reared in the temple precincts. How fortunate the roof that shelters for us the martyr mother of the martyr Maccabees, all girt with crowns. Though every day you confess Christ by keeping his commandments, you have added to this private glory the public fame of an open confession. And it was by your efforts in the past that the poison of the Arian heresy was expelled from your city. Perhaps you may wonder at my beginning afresh, thus, at the end of the letter. What am I to do? I cannot preclude my heart from utterance. The brief limits of a letter force me to be silent, but my longing for your company compels me to speak. My words pour out in eager haste, my language is confused and disjointed, but love knows nothing of order. End of Letter 7 
Letter 10 to Paul, an old man of Concordia, by St. Jerome, from the desert of Chalcis in 374 A.D. The shortness of a man's life is the punishment for man's sin, and the fact that even on the very threshold of the light, death constantly overtakes the newborn child proves that the times are continually sinking into deeper depravity. For when the first tiller of paradise had been entangled by the serpent in his snaky coils, and had been forced in consequence to migrate earthwards, although his deathless state was changed for a mortal one, yet the sentence of man's curse was put off for nine hundred years or even more, a period so long that it may be called a second immortality. Afterwards, sin gradually grew more and more virulent, till the ungodliness of the giants brought in its train the shipwreck of the whole world. Then, when the world had been cleansed by the baptism, if I may so call it, of the deluge, human life was contracted to a short span. Yet even this we have almost altogether wasted, so continually do our iniquities fight against the divine purposes. For how few there are, either who go beyond their hundredth year, or who going beyond it, do not regret that they have done so, according to that which the Scripture witnesses in the book of Psalms. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. Why, say you, these opening reflections, so remote and so far-fetched, that one might use against them the Horatian witticism, Back to the eggs which Leda laid for Zeus, the bard is fain to trace the war of Troy? Simply that I may describe in fitting terms your great age and hoary head as white as Christ's in Revelation. For, see, the hundredth circling year is already passing over you, and yet always keeping the commandments of the Lord, amid the circumstances of your present life, you think over the blessedness of that which is to come. Your eyes are bright and keen, your steps steady, your hearing good, your teeth are white, your voice musical, your flesh firm and full of sap. Your ruddy cheeks belie your white hairs. Your strength is not that of your age. Advancing years have not, as we too often see them do, impaired the tenacity of your memory. The coldness of your blood has not blunted an intellect at once warm and wary. Your face is not wrinkled nor your brow furrowed. Lastly, no tremors palsy your hand, or cause it to travel in crooked pathways over the wax on which you write. The Lord shows us in you the bloom of the resurrection that is to be ours, so that, whereas in others who die by inches while yet living, we recognize the results of sin, in your case, we ascribe it to righteousness that you still simulate youth at an age to which it is foreign. And although we see the like haleness of body in many even of those who are sinners, in their case it is a grant of the devil to lead them into sin, while in yours it is a gift of God to make you rejoice. Tolly, in his brilliant speech on behalf of Flaccus, describes the learning of the Greeks as innate frivolity and accomplished vanity. Certainly, their ablest literary men used to receive money for pronouncing eulogies upon their kings or princes. Following their example, I set a price on my praise. Nor must you suppose my demand to be a small one. You are asked to give me the pearl of the gospel, the words of the Lord, pure words, even as the silver which from the earth is tried and purified seven times in the fire. I mean, the commentaries of fortunation. And, 
and for its account of the persecutors, the history of Aurelius Victor, and with these, the letters of Novation, so that, learning the poison set forth by this schismatic, we may the more gr gladly drink of the antidote supplied by the holy martyr Cyprian. In the meantime, I have sent to you, that is to say, to Paul the aged, a Paul that is older still. I have taken great pains to bring my language down to the level of the simpler sort. But somehow or other, though you fill it with water, the jar retains the odor which it acquired when first used. If my little gifts should please you, I have others also in store, which, if the Holy Spirit shall breathe favorably, shall sail across the sea to you with all kinds of Eastern merchandise. End of Letter 10 Letter 13 To Castorina, his maternal aunt, by St. Jerome The Apostle and Evangelist John rightly says in his first epistle that whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. For since murder often springs from hate, the hater, even though he has not yet slain his victim, is at heart a murderer. Why, you ask, do I begin in this style? Simply that you and I may both lay aside past ill-feeling and cleanse our hearts to be a habitation for God. Be angry, David says, and sin not, or, as the Apostle more fully expresses it, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What then shall we do in the day of judgment, upon whose wrath the sun has gone down, not one day, but many years? The Lord says in the Gospel, If thou bringst your gift to the altar, and there rememberest that your brother has anything against you, leave there your gift before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Woe to me, wretch that I am! Woe, I had almost said to you also. Ah, this long time past, we have either offered no gift at the altar, or have offered it while cherishing anger without a cause. How have we been able in our daily prayers to say, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, while our feelings have been at variance with our words, and our petition inconsistent with our conduct? Therefore, I renew the prayer which I made a year ago in a previous letter, that the Lord's legacy of peace may indeed be ours and that my desires and your feelings may find favor in his sight. Soon we shall stand before his judgment seat to receive the reward of harmony restored, or pay the penalty for harmony broken. In case you shall prove unwilling, I hope it may not be so, to accept my advances I, for my part, shall be free, for this letter, when it is read, will ensure my acquittal. End of Letter 13 to Castorina, His Maternal Aunt, by St. Jerome The date of the letter is 374 A.D. Letter 22 to Eustochium by St. Jerome Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget also your own people and your father's house, and the king shall desire your beauty. In this forty-fourth psalm, God speaks to the human soul, that following the example of Abraham, it should go out from its own land and from its kindred, and should leave the Chaldeans, that is, the demons, and should dwell in the country of the living, for which elsewhere the prophet sighs, I think to see the good things of the Lord in the land of the living. But 
it is not enough for you to go out from your own land unless you forget your people and your father's house, unless you scorn the flesh and cling to the bridegroom in a close embrace. Look not behind you, he says, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. He who has grasped the plow must not look behind him or return home from the field, or, having Christ's garment, descend from the roof to fetch other raiment. Truly a marvelous thing! A father charges his daughter not to remember her father. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father it is your will to do. So it was said to the Jews, and in another place, He that commits sin is of the devil. Born of such parents, we are black by nature, and even when we have repented, so long as we have not scaled the heights of virtue, we may still say, I am black, but comely, O you daughters of Jerusalem. But you will say to me, I have left the home of my childhood, I have forgotten my father, I am born anew in Christ. What reward do I receive for this? The context shows, The king shall desire your beauty. This, then, is the great mystery. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be, not as is there said, of one flesh, but of one spirit. Your bridegroom is not haughty or disdainful. He has married an Ethiopian woman. When once you desire the wisdom of the true Solomon, and come to him, he will avow all his knowledge to you. He will lead you, as a king, to his chamber, with his royal hand. He will miraculously change the color of your nature, so that it shall be said of you, Who is this that goes up, and has been made white? I am writing to you thus, Lady Eustochium. I am bound to call my lord's bride, Lady to show you by my opening words that my object is not to praise the virginity which you follow and of which you have proved the value or yet to recount the drawbacks of marriage such as pregnancy the crying of infants the torture caused by a rival the cares of household management and all those fancied blessings which death at last cut short not that married women are as such outside the pale they have their own place the marriage that is honorable and the bed undefiled my purpose is to show you that you are fleeing from sodom and should take warning by lot's wife there is no flattery i can tell you in these pages a flatterer's words are fair but for all that, he is an enemy. You need expect no rhetorical flourishes setting you among the angels. And while they extol virginity as blessed, putting the world at your feet. I would have you draw from your monastic vow. Not pride, but fear. When you walk laden with gold, you must beware of robbers. For mortals, this life is a race. We run it on earth, so that we may receive our crown elsewhere. No man can walk secure amid serpents and scorpions. The Lord says, My sword has drunk its fill in heaven. And do you expect peace on the earth 
which yields only thorns and thistles and is itself the serpent's food? Our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are surrounded by the thronging hosts of our foes. Our enemies are on every side. The flesh is weak, and soon it will be ashes. But today, it fights alone against a multitude. But when the flesh has been melted away, and the prince of yonder world has come and found in it no sin, then in safety you shall listen to the prophet's words. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day, nor for the trouble that haunts thee in the darkness, nor for the demon and his attacks at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. If the hosts of the enemy beset you, if the allurements of sin begin to burn within your breast, if in your troubled thoughts you ask, What shall I do? Elisha's words will give you an answer. Fear not. For those that be with us are more than those that be with them. He will pray for you and will say, Lord, open the eyes of your handmaid that she may see. And when your eyes have been opened, you will see a chariot of fire which will carry you, as it carried Elijah, up to the stars. And then you will joyfully sing, our soul is escaped as a sparrow out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. As long as we are held down by this frail body, as long as we keep our treasure in earthen vessels, and the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, so long can there be no sure victory. Our adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. David says, You make darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. The devil does not look for unbelievers or for those who are outside whose flesh the Assyrian king roasted in a pot. It is the church of Christ that the devil hastens to ravish. According to Habakkuk, his dainty morsels are of the choicest. He desires Job's ruin, and after devouring Judas, he seeks power to put all the apostles through his sieve. The Savior did not come to send peace upon the earth, but a sword. Lucifer fell, Lucifer who used to rise with the dawn, and he, who was nurtured in a paradise of delight, heard the well-earned sentence, Though you exalt yourself as the eagle, from there will I bring you down, says the Lord. For Lucifer had said in his heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most High. Wherefore, God every day says to the angels, as they go down the stairway which Jacob saw in his dream, I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. The devil fell first, and since God stands in the congregation of the gods and judges them in the midst, the apostle writes to those who are ceasing to be gods, Whereas there is among you envying and strife, are you not carnal and walk as men? The apostle Paul, who was a chosen vessel set apart for the gospel of Christ, because of the spur of the flesh, 
and the allurements of sin, keeps his body down and subjects it to slavery, lest in preaching to others he himself be found a reprobate. And if yet, for all that, he sees another law in his members warring against the law of his mind, and bringing him into captivity to the law of sin. If, after nakedness, fasting, hunger, imprisonment, scourging, and other torments, he turns back to himself and cries, O oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Do you fancy that you ought to lay aside apprehension? See to it that God not say some day of you, The Virgin of Israel is fallen, and there is none to raise her up. I say it boldly. Though God can do all things, He cannot raise up a virgin when once she has fallen from virginity. He may indeed relieve one who is defiled from the penalty of her sin, but he will not give her the crown of virginity. Let us fear, lest in us also the prophecy be fulfilled. Good virgins shall faint. Notice it is good virgins who are spoken of, for there are bad ones as well. Whosoever looks on a woman, the Lord says, to lust after her, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So virginity may be lost even by a thought. Such are evil virgins, virgins in the flesh but not in the spirit, foolish virgins, who having no oil are shut out by the bridegroom. But if even real virgins, when they have other failings, are not saved by their physical virginity, what shall become of those who have prostituted the members of Christ, and have changed the temple of the Holy Spirit into a brothel? Straightway they shall hear the words, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstone and grind meal. Uncover your locks, make bare your legs, pass over the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, your shame shall be seen. And shall she come to this, after the bridal chamber of God the Son? after the kisses of him who is to her both kinsman and spouse? Yes, she of whom the prophetic utterance once sang. The queen stands on your right hand, arrayed in gold, wrought about with various colors, shall be made naked, and her skirts shall be found upon her face. She shall sit by the waters of loneliness, her pitchers laid aside, and shall open her feet to everyone who passes by. And she shall be polluted to the crown of her head. It would have been better for her to have submitted to the yoke of marriage, to have walked in level places, than thus, aspiring to lofty heights, to fall into the depths of hell. I pray you, do not let Zion, the faithful city, become a harlot. Let it not be that where the Trinity has been entertained, demons shall dance, and owls make their nests, and jackals build. Let us not loose the belt that confines the breast. As soon as lust begins to tickle the senses, and the soft fires of pleasure envelop us with the delightful warmth. Let us break forth and cry, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what the flesh can do to me. When for a moment the inner man shows signs of wavering between vice and virtue, say, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, 
for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. I would not have you allow any such thoughts to rise. Let nothing disorderly, nothing that is of Babylon, find shelter in your breast. Slay the enemy while he is small. Nip evil in the bud, and then you will not have a crop of tares. Hearken to the words of the psalmist. Hapless daughter of Babylon, happy shall he be that rewards thee as you have served us. Happy shall he be that takes and dashes your little ones against the stones. It is impossible that the body's natural heat should not sometimes assail a man and kindle sensual desire. But he is praised and accounted blessed, who when thoughts begin to rise, gives them no quarter, but dashes them straightway against the rock. And the rock is Christ. Oh, how often when I was living in the desert in that lonely waste, scorched by the burning sun, which affords to hermits a savage dwelling place, how often did I fancy myself surrounded by the pleasures of Rome. I used to sit alone, for I was filled with bitterness. My unkempt limbs were covered in shapeless sackcloth. My skin, through long neglect, had become as rough and black as an Ethiopian's. Tears and groans were every day my portion. And if sleep ever overcame my resistance and fell upon my eyes, I bruised my restless bones against the naked earth. Of food and drink I will not speak. Hermits have nothing but cold water even when they are sick, and for them it is sinful luxury to partake of cooked dishes. But though in my fear of hell I had condemned myself to this prison house, where my only companions were scorpions and wild beasts, I often found myself surrounded by bands of dancing girls. My face was pale with fasting, but though my limbs were cold as ice, my mind was burning with desire, and the fires of lust kept bubbling up before me when my flesh was as good as dead. And so, when all other help failed me, I used to fling myself at Jesus' feet. I watered them with my tears, I wiped them with my hair. And if my flesh still rebelled, I subdued it by weeks of fasting. I do not blush to confess my misery. Nay, rather I lament that I am not now what once I was. I remember that often I joined night to day with my wailings, and did not cease from beating my breast till tranquility returned to me at the Lord's behest. I used to dread my poor cell, as though it knew my secret thoughts. Filled with stiff anger against myself, I would make my way alone into the desert, and when I came upon some hollow valley or rough mountain or precipitous cliff, there I would set up my oratory and make that spot a place of torture for my unhappy flesh. There, sometimes also, the Lord himself is my witness. After many a tear and straining of my eyes to heaven, I felt myself in the presence of the angelic hosts, and in joy and gladness would sing, Because of the savor of your good ointments, we will run after you. If such are the temptations of men whose bodies are emaciated with fasting, so that they have only evil thoughts to withstand, how must it fare with a girl who clings to the enjoyment of luxuries? Surely, as the Apostle says, she is dead while yet she lives. Therefore, if I may advise you, and if experience gives my advice weight, I would begin with an urgent exhortation. 
as Christ's spouse, avoid wine as you would poison. Wine is the first weapon the devils use in attacking the young. The restlessness of greed, the windiness of pride, the delights of ostentation are nothing to this. Other vices we easily forgo. This is an enemy within our walls, and wherever we go we carry our foe with us. Wine and youth. Behold a double source for pleasure's fire. Why throw oil on the flame? Why give fresh fuel to a wretched body that is already ablaze? Paul says to Timothy, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for your often infirmities. Notice the reasons why wine is allowed. It is to cure pain in the stomach and to relieve a frequent infirmity. And hardly then. And, lest we should indulge ourselves too much on the score of our ailments, he commands that but little shall be taken, advising rather as a physician than as an apostle, though indeed an apostle is a spiritual physician. He evidently feared that Timothy might succumb to weakness and might prove unequal to the constant moving to and fro involved in preaching the gospel. Besides, he remembered that he had spoken of wine wherein is excess, and had said that it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. Noah drank wine and became intoxicated, but living as he did in the rude age after the flood when the vine was first planted, Perhaps he did not know its power of inebriation. And to let you see the hidden meaning of Scripture in all its fullness, for the word of God is a pearl, and may be pierced on every side. After Noah's drunkenness came the uncovering of his body. Self-indulgence culminated in lust. First the belly is crammed, then the um other members are roused. Similarly, at a later period, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and rose up to play. Lot also, God's friend, whom he saved upon the mountain, who was the only one found righteous out of so many thousands, was intoxicated by his daughters. And although they may have acted as they did more from a desire of offspring than from love of sinful pleasure, for the human race seemed in danger of extinction, yet they were well aware that the righteous man would not abide their design unless intoxicated. In fact, he did not know what he was doing, and his sin was not willful. Still, his error was a grave one, for it made him the father of Moab and Ammon, Israel's enemies, of whom it is said, even to the fourteenth generation, they shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord for ever. When Elijah, in his flight from Jezebel, lay weary and desolate beneath the oak, there came an angel who raised him up and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake and a cruise of water at his head. Had God willed it, might he not have sent his prophet spiced wines, and dainty dishes, and flesh basted into tenderness? When, Elisha, when Elisha invited the sons of the prophets to dinner, he gave them only field herbs to eat. And when all cried out with one voice, There is death in the pot, the man of God did not storm at the cooks for he was not used to very sumptuous fare. But he caused meal to be brought, and casting it in, sweetened the bitter mess with spiritual strength, as Moses had once sweetened the waters of Mara. Again, when men were sent to arrest the prophet, and were smitten with physical and mental blindness, that he might bring them without their own knowledge to Samaria, 
noticed the food with which Elisha ordered them to be refreshed. Set bread and water, he said, before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And Daniel, who might have had rich food from the king's table, preferred the mower's breakfast brought to him by Habakkuk, which must have been but country fare. He was called a man of desires, because he would not eat the bread of desire or drink the wine of concupiscence. There are in the scriptures countless divine answers condemning gluttony and approving simple food. But as fasting is not my present theme, and an adequate discussion of it would require a treatise in itself, these few observations must suffice of the many which the subject suggests. By them you will understand why the first man, obeying his belly and not God, was cast down from paradise into this vale of tears, and why Satan used hunger to tempt the Lord himself in the wilderness, and why the apostle cries, Food for the belly and the belly for food, but God shall destroy both it and them. And why he speaks of the self-indulgent as men whose God is their belly. For men invariably worship what they like best. Care must be taken, therefore, that abstinence may bring back to paradise those whom satiety once drove out. You will tell me, perhaps, that, high-born as you are, reared in luxury and used to lie on a soft bed, that you cannot do without wine and dainties, and would find a stricter rule of life unendurable. If so, I can only say, live then by your own rule, since God's rule is too hard for you. Not that the Creator and Lord of all takes pleasure in a rumbling and empty stomach, or in fevered lungs, but that these are indispensable as means to the preservation of chastity. Job was dear to God, perfect and upright before him. Yet hear what he says of the devil. His strength is in the loins, and his force is in the navel. The terms are chosen for decency's sake, but the reproductive organs of the two sexes are meant. Thus the descendant of David, who according to the promise is to sit upon his throne, is said to come from his loins. And the seventy-five souls descended from Jacob who entered Egypt are said to come out of Jacob's thigh. So also when his thigh shrank after the Lord had wrestled with him, he ceased to beget children. The Israelites, again, are told to celebrate the Passover with loins girded and mortified. God says to Job, Gird up your loins as a man. John wears a leathern girdle. The apostles must gird their loins to carry the lamps of the gospel. When Ezekiel tells us how Jerusalem is found in the plain of wandering, covered with blood, he uses the words, Your navel has not been cut. In his assaults on men, therefore, the devil's strength is in the loins. In his attacks on women, his force is in the navel. Do you wish for proof of my assertions? Take examples. Samson was braver than a lion and tougher than a rock. Alone and unprotected, he pursued a thousand armed men. And yet in Delilah's embrace, his resolution melted away. David was a man after God's own heart, and his lips had often sung of the Holy One, the future Christ. And yet, as he walked upon his housetop, he was fascinated by Bathsheba's nudity and added murder to adultery. Notice here how even in his own house a man cannot use his eyes without danger. 
Then, repenting, David says to the Lord, Against you, you alone have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight. Being a king, he feared no one else. So too with Solomon. Wisdom used him to sing her praise, and he treated of all plants, from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. And yet Solomon went back from God, because he was a lover of women. And as if to show that near relationship is no safeguard, Amnon burned with illicit passion for his sister Tamar. I cannot bring myself to speak of the many virgins who daily fall and are lost to the bosom of the church, their mother. Stars over which the proud foe sets up his throne, and rocks hollowed by the serpent that he may dwell in their fissures. You may see many women who are widows before they are wedded, who try to conceal their miserable fall by a lying garb. Unless they are betrayed by swelling wombs or by the crying of their infants, they walk abroad with tripping feet and heads in the air. Some go so far as to take potions that they may ensure barrenness, and thus they murder human beings almost before their conception. Some, when they find themselves with child through their sin, use drugs to procure abortion, and when, as often happens, they die with their offspring, they enter the lower world laden with guilt not only of adultery against Christ, but also of suicide and of child murder. Yet it is these who say, To the pure all things are pure. My conscience is enough guide for me. A pure heart is what God looks for. Why should I abstain from foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving? And when they wish to appear agreeable and entertaining, they first drench themselves with wine, and then joining the grossest profanity to intoxication, they say, oh, Far be it for me to abstain from the blood of Christ. And when they see someone else pale or sad, they call her wretch or Manichaean. Huh, quite logically indeed, for on their principles fasting involves heresy. When they go out, they do their best to attract notice, and with nods and winks, they encourage troops of young fellows to follow them. Of each and all of these, the prophet's words are true. You have a whore's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Their robes have but a narrow purple stripe, it is true, and their headdress is somewhat loose, so as to leave the hair free. From their shoulders flutters the lilac mantle which they call ma forte. They have their feet in cheap slippers, and their arms tucked up tight-fitting sleeves. Add to these marks of their profession an easy gait, and you have all the virginity they possess. Such may have eulogizers of their own, and may fetch a higher price in the market of perdition merely because they are called virgins. But to such virgins as these, I prefer to uh, be displeasing. <sighs> I blush to speak of it. It is so shocking. Yet, though sad, it is true. How comes this plague of the agapete to be in the church? From where come these unwedded wives, these new concubines, these harlots? so I will call them, though they cling to a single partner. One house holds them in one chamber. They often occupy the same bed, and yet they call us suspicious if we fancy anything amiss. A brother leaves his virgin sister. A virgin, slighting her unmarried brother, seeks a brother in a stranger. Both alike profess to have but one object, to find spiritual consolation from those not of their kin. The 
that their real aim is to indulge in sexual intercourse. It is on such that Solomon, in the book of Proverbs, heaps his scorn. Can a man take fire in his bosom, he says, and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? We cast out, then, and banish from our sight those who only wish to seem and not be virgins. Henceforward, I may bring all my speech to bear upon you, who, as it is your lot to be the first virgin of noble birth in Rome, have to labor the more diligently not to lose good things to come, as well as those that are present. You have at least learned from a case in your own family the troubles of wedded life and the uncertainties of marriage. Your sister Blasilla, before you in age but behind you in declining the vow of virginity, has become a widow only seven months after she has taken a husband. Oh, hapless plight of us mortals who do not know what is before us. She has lost at one time the crown of virginity and the pleasures of wedlock. And although as a widow the second degree of chastity is hers, still can you not imagine the continual crosses she has to bear, daily seeing in her sister what she has lost herself? and while she finds it hard to go without the pleasures of wedlock, has less reward for her present continence. Still, she too may take heart and rejoice. The fruit which is a hundredfold and that which is sixtyfold both spring from one seed, and that seed is chastity. End of Part 1 of Letter 22 Letter 22 to Eustochium by St. Jerome, Part 2 Do not court the company of married ladies, or visit the houses of the highborn. Do not look too often on the life which you despised to become a virgin. Women of the world, you know, plume themselves because their husbands are on the bench or in other high positions and the wife of the emperor always has an eager throng of visitors at her door. Why do you, then, wrong your husband? Why do you, God's bride, hasten to visit the wife of a mere man? Learn in this respect a holy pride. Know that you are better than they, and not only must you avoid intercourse, with those who are puffed up by their husbands' honors, who are hedged in with troops of eunuchs, and who wear robes inwrought with threads of gold, you must also shun those who are widows from necessity and not from choice. Not that they ought to have desired the death of their husbands, but that they have not welcomed the opportunity of continence when it has come. As it is, they only change their garb. Their old self-seeking remains unchanged. To see them in their capacious litters with red cloaks and plump bodies, a row of eunuchs walking in front of them, you would fancy them not to have lost husbands, but to be seeking them. Their houses are filled with flatterers and with guests. The very clergy who ought to inspire them with respect by their teaching and authority kiss these ladies on the forehead, and, putting forth their hands, so that if you knew no better you might suppose them in the act of blessing, take wages for their visits. They meanwhile, seeing that priests cannot do without them, are lifted up into pride and, as having had experience of both, they prefer the license of widowhood to the restraints of marriage. They call themselves chaste livers and nuns. After an immoderate supper, they retire to rest, to dream of the apostles. 
let your companions be women pale and thin with fasting, and approved by their years and conduct, such as daily sing in their hearts, Tell me where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon, and say with true earnestness, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Be subject to your parents, imitating the example of your spouse. Rarely go abroad, and if you wish to seek the aid of the martyrs, seek it in your own chamber. For you will never need a pretext for going out if you are always going out when there is need. Take food in moderation, and never overload your stomach. For many women, temperate as regards wine, are intemperate in the use of food. When you rise at night to pray, let your breath be that of an empty and not of an overfull stomach. Read often. Learn all that you can. Let sleep overcome you the scroll still in your hands. When your head falls, let it be on the sacred page. Let your fasts be of daily occurrence, and your refreshment such as avoids satiety. It is idle to carry an empty stomach if, in two or three days' time, the fast is to be made up for by repletion. When cloyed, the mind immediately grows sluggish, and when the ground is watered, it puts forth the thorns of lust. If ever you feel the outward man sighing for the flower of youth, and if, as you lie on your couch after a meal, you are excited by the alluring train of sensual desires, then seize the shield of faith, for it alone can quench the fiery darts of the devil. They are all adulterers, says the prophet. They have made up ready their heart like an oven. But do you keep close to the footsteps of Christ, and intent upon his words say, Did not our heart burn within us by the road, while Jesus opened to us the scriptures? And again, Your word is tried to the uttermost, and your servant loves it. It is hard for the human soul to avoid loving something, and our mind must of necessity give way to affection of one kind or another. The love of the flesh is overcome by the love of the spirit. Desire is quenched by desire. What is taken from the one increases the other. Therefore, as you lie on your couch, Say again and again, By night have I sought him whom my soul loves. Mortify, therefore, says the Apostle, your members which are upon the earth. Because he himself did so, he could afterwards say with confidence, I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me. He who mortifies his members, and feels that he is walking in a vain show, is not afraid to say, I have become like a bottle in the frost. Whatever there was in me of the moisture of lust has been dried out of me. And again, my knees are weak through fasting. I forget to eat my bread. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. Be like the grasshopper, and make night musical. Nightly, wash your bed and water your couch with your tears. Watch, and be like the sparrow alone upon the housetop. Sing with the spirit, but sing with the understanding also. And let your song be that of the psalmist. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. Can we, any of us, honestly make his words our own? I have eaten ashes like bread, and mingled my drink with weeping. 
Yet should we not weep and groan, when the serpent invites us, as he invited our first parents, to eat forbidden fruit? And when, after expelling us from the paradise of virginity, he desires to clothe us with mantles of skins, such as that which Elijah, on his return to paradise, left behind him on earth? Say to yourself, what have I to do with the pleasures of sense that so soon come to an end? What have I to do with the song of the sirens, so sweet and so fatal to those who hear it? I would not have you subject to that sentence whereby condemnation has been passed upon mankind. When God says to Eve, In pain and in sorrow you shall bring forth children, Say to yourself, That is a law for a married woman, not for me. And when he continues, Your desire shall be to your husband, Say again, Let her desire be to her husband, Who has not Christ for her spouse. And when, last of all, he says, You shall surely die. Once more say, Marriage, indeed, must end in death, but the life on which I have resolved is independent of sex. Let those who are wives keep the place and the time that properly belong to them. For me, virginity is consecrated in the persons of Mary and of Christ. Someone may say, Do you dare detract from wedlock, which is a state blessed by God? I do not detract from wedlock when I set virginity in front of it. No one compares a bad thing with a good. Wedded women may congratulate themselves that they come next to virgins. Be fruitful, God says, and multiply and replenish the earth. He who desires to replenish the earth may increase and multiply if he will. But the train to which you belong is not on earth, but in heaven. The command to increase and multiply first finds fulfillment after the expulsion from paradise, after the nakedness and the fig leaves which speak of sexual passion. Let them marry and be given in marriage, who eat their bread in the sweat of their brow, whose land brings forth to them thorns and thistles, and whose crops are choked with briars. My seed produces fruit a hundredfold. All men cannot receive God's saying, but they to whom it is given. Some people may be eunuchs from necessity. I am one of free will. There is a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There is a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. Now that out of the hard stones of the Gentiles God has raised up children unto Abraham, they begin to be holy stones rolling upon the earth. They pass through the whirlwinds of the world and roll on in God's chariot on rapid wheels. Let those stitch coats to themselves who have lost the coat woven from the top throughout who delight in the cries of infants, which, as soon as they see the light, lament that they are born. In paradise Eve was a virgin, and it was only after the coats of skins that she began her married life. Now paradise is your home, too. Keep, therefore, your birthright, and say, Return unto your rest, O my soul. To show that virginity is natural, while wedlock only follows guilt, what is born of wedlock is virgin flesh, and it gives back in fruit what in root it has lost. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a flower shall grow out of his roots. The rod is the mother of the Lord, simple, pure, unsullied, drawing no germ of life from without, but fruitful in singleness, like God himself. The flower of the rod 
is Christ, who says of himself, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. In another place he is foretold to be a stone cut out of the mountain without hands, a figure by which the prophet signifies that he is to be born a virgin from a virgin. For the hands are here a figure of wedlock, as in the passage, His left hand is under my head, and his right hand does embrace me. It agrees also with this interpretation that the unclean animals are led into Noah's ark in pairs, while of the clean an uneven number are taken. Similarly, when Moses and Joshua were bidden to remove their shoes because the ground on which they stood was holy, the command had a mystical meaning. So too, when the disciples were appointed to preach the gospel, they were told to take with them neither shoe nor shoe latchet, and when the soldiers came to cast lots for the garments of Jesus, they found no boots that they could take away. For the Lord could not himself possess what he had forbidden to his servants. I praise wedlock. I praise marriage. But it is because they give me virgins. I gather the rose from the thorns, the gold from the earth, the pearl from the shell. Does the plowman plow all day to sow? Shall he not also enjoy the fruit of his labor? Wedlock is the more honored, the more what is born of it is loved. Why, mother, do you grudge your daughter her virginity? She has been reared on your milk, she has come from your womb, she has grown up in your bosom. Your watchful attention has kept her a virgin. Are you angry with her, because she chooses to be a king's wife and not a soldier's? She has conferred on you a high privilege. You are now the mother-in-law of God. Concerning virgins, says the apostle, I have no commandment of the Lord. Why was this? Because his own virginity was due not to a command, but to his free choice. For they are not to be heard who feign him to have had a wife. For when he is discussing continence and commending perpetual chastity, he uses the words, I would that all men were even as I myself. And farther on, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. And in another place, have we not power to lead about wives even as the rest of the apostles? Why then? Has he no commandment from the Lord concerning virginity? Because what is freely offered is worth more than what is extorted by force. And to command virginity would have been to abrogate wedlock. It would have been a hard enactment to compel opposition to nature and to extort from men the angelic life. And not only so, it would have been to condemn what is a divine ordinance. The old law had a different ideal of blessedness, for therein it is said, Blessed is he who has seed in Zion and a family in Jerusalem, and cursed is the barren who bears not, and your children shall be like olive plants round about your table. Riches, too, are promised to the faithful, and we are told that there was not one feeble person among their tribes. But now, even to eunuchs it is said, Say not, Behold, I am a dry tree. For instead of sons and daughters, you have a place forever in heaven. Now the poor are blessed. Now Lazarus is set before dives in his purple. Now he who is weak is counted strong. But in those days the world was still unpeopled. Accordingly, to pass over instances of childlessness meant only to serve as types. 
those only were considered happy who could boast of children. It was for this reason that Abraham in his old age married Keturah, that Leah hired Jacob with her son's mandrakes, and that fair Rachel, a type of the church, complained of the closing of her womb. But gradually the crop grew up, and then the reaper was sent forth with his sickle. Elijah lived a virgin life. So also did Elisha, and many of the sons of the prophets. To Jeremiah the command came, You shall not take you a wife. He had been sanctified in his mother's womb, and now he was forbidden to take a wife, because the captivity was near. The apostle gives the same counsel in different words. I think, therefore, that this is good by reason of the present distress, namely, that it is good for a man to be as he is. What is this distress which does away with the joys of wedlock? The Apostle tells us in a later verse, The time is short. It remains that those who have wives be as though they had none. Nebuchadnezzar is hard at hand. The lion is bestirring himself from his lair. What good will marriage be to me if it is to end in slavery to the haughtiest of kings? What good will little ones be to me if their lot is to be that which the prophet sadly describes? The tongue of the sucking child cleaves to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The young children ask for bread and no man breaks it unto them. In those days, as I have said, the virtue of continence was found only in men. Eve still continued to travail with children. But now that a virgin has conceived in the womb and has borne to us a child of which the prophet says that government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Now that the chain of the curse is broken, death came through Eve, but life has come through Mary. And thus the gift of virginity has been bestowed most richly upon women, seeing that it has had its beginning from a woman. As soon as the Son of God set foot upon the earth, he formed for himself a new household there, that, as he was adored by angels in heaven, angels might serve him also on earth. Then chaste Judith once more cut off the head of Holofernes. Then Haman, whose name means iniquity, was once more burned in fire of his own kindling. Then James and John forsook father and net and ship and followed the Savior. Neither kinship nor the world's ties nor the care of their home could hold them back. Then were the words heard, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For no soldier goes with a wife to battle. Even when a disciple would have buried his father, the Lord forbade him and said, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. So you must not complain if you have but scanty house room. In the same strain the Apostle writes, He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. How great inconveniences are involved in wedlock, and how many anxieties encompass it, I have, I think, described shortly in my treatise published against Helvidius on the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mary. 
It would be tedious to go over the same ground now, and any one who pleases may draw from that fountain. But lest I should seem wholly to have passed over the matter, I will just say now that the Apostle bids us pray without ceasing, and that he who in the married state renders his wife her due cannot so pray. Either we pray always and are virgins, or we cease to pray that we may fulfill the claims of marriage. Still, he says, if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. At the outset, I promised that I should say little or nothing of the embarrassments of wedlock, and now I give you notice to the same effect. If you want to know from how many vexations a virgin is free, and by how many a wife is fettered, you should read Tertullian to a philosophic friend, and his other treatises on virginity, the blessed Cyprian's noble volume, the writings of Pope Damasus in prose and verse, and the treatises recently written for his sister by our own Ambrose. In these he has poured forth his soul with such a flood of eloquence that he has sought out, set forth, and put in order all that bears on the praise of virgins. We must proceed by a different path, for our purpose is not the praise of virginity, but its preservation. To know that it is a good thing is not enough. When we have chosen it, we must guard it with jealous care. The first only requires judgment, and we share it with many. The second calls for toil, and few compete with us in it. He that shall endure unto the end, the Lord says, the same shall be saved. And many are called, but few are chosen. Therefore I beg you before God and Jesus Christ and his elect angels to guard that which you have received, not readily exposing to the public gaze the vessels of the Lord's temple, which only the priests are by right allowed to see, that no profane person may look upon God's sanctuary. Uzzah, when he touched the ark, which it was not lawful to touch, was struck down suddenly by death, and assuredly, no gold or silver vessel was ever so dear to God as is the temple of a virgin's body. The shadow went before, but now the reality has come. You indeed may speak in all simplicity, and from motives of amiability may treat with courtesy the various strangers, but unchaste eyes seemed nothing aright. They fail to appreciate the beauty of the soul, and only value that of the body. Hezekiah showed God's treasure to the Assyrians, who ought never to have seen what they were sure to covet. The consequence was that Judea was torn by continual wars, and that the very first things carried away to Babylon were those vessels of the Lord. We find Belshazzar at his feast and among his concubines. Vice always glories in defiling what is noble. Drinking out of these sacred cups. Never incline your ear to words of mischief, for men often say an improper word to make trial of a virgin's steadfastness, to see if she hears it with pleasure and if she is ready to unbend at every silly jest. Such persons applaud whatever you affirm, and deny whatever you deny. They speak of you as not only holy, but accomplished, and say that in you there is no guile. Behold, say they, a true handmaid of Christ! Behold, entire singleness of heart! How different from that rough, unsightly, countrified fright, who most likely never married because she could never find a husband. 
our natural weakness induces us readily to listen to such flatterers. But though we may blush and reply that such praise is more than our due, the soul within us rejoices to hear itself praised. Like the Ark of the Covenant, Christ's spouse should be overlaid with gold within and without. She should be the guardian of the law of the Lord. Just as the Ark contained nothing but the tables of the Covenant, so in you there should be no thought of anything that is outside. For it pleases the Lord to sit in your mind as he once sat on the mercy seat and the cherubims. As he sent his disciples to loose him the foal of an ass, that he might ride upon it, so he sends them to release you from the cares of the world, that, leaving the bricks and straw of Egypt, you may follow him, the true Moses, through the wilderness, and may enter the land of promise. Let no one dare to forbid you, neither mother nor sister nor kinswoman nor brother. The Lord has need of you. Should they seek to hinder you, let them fear the scourges that fell on Pharaoh, who, because he would not let God's people go, that they might serve him, suffered the plagues described in Scripture. Jesus, entering into the temple, cast out those things which did not belong to the temple. For God is jealous, and will not allow the Father's house to be made a den of robbers. Where money is counted, where doves are sold, where simplicity is stifled, where, that is, a virgin's breast glows with cares of this world, straightway the veil of the temple is rent. The bridegroom rises in anger. He says, Your house is left unto you desolate. Read the gospel and see how Mary, sitting at the feet of the Lord, is set before the zealous Martha. In her anxiety to be hospitable, Martha was preparing a meal for the Lord and his disciples. Yet Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things but few things are needful, or one. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Be, then, like Mary. Prefer the food of the soul to that of the body. Leave it to your sisters to run to and fro, and to seek how they may fitly welcome Christ. But do you, having once for all cast away the burden of the world, Sit at the Lord's feet, and say, I have found him whom my soul loves. I will hold him. I will not let him go. And he will answer, My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bore her. Now the mother of whom this is said is the heavenly Jerusalem. End of Part 2 of Letter 22 to Eustochium Letter 22 to Eustochium by St. Jerome Part 3 Ever let the privacy of your chamber guard you. Ever let the bridegroom sport with you within. Do you pray? You speak to the bridegroom. Do you read? He speaks to you. When sleep overtakes you, he will come behind and put his hand through the hole of the door, and your heart shall be moved for him, and you will awake and rise up and say, I am sick from love. Then he will reply, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Do not go from home nor visit the daughters of a strange land, though you have patriarchs for brothers and Israel for a father. Dinah went out and was seduced. Do not seek the bridegroom in the streets. Do not go round the corners of the city. For though you may say, 
I will rise now and go about the city, in the streets and in the broad ways. I will seek him whom my soul loves. And though you may ask the watchman, Have you seen him whom my soul loves? No one will deign to answer you. The bridegroom cannot be found in the streets. Straight and narrow is the way which leads unto life. So the song goes on. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. And would that that failure to find him were all. You will be wounded and stripped. You will lament and say, The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. They took away my veil from me. Now, if one who could say, I sleep, but my heart wakes, and a bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me, he shall lie all night between my breasts. If one who could speak thus suffered so much because she went abroad, what shall become of us who are but young girls, of us who, when the bride grows in with the bridegroom, still remain without? Jesus is jealous. He does not choose that your face should be seen by others. You may excuse yourself and say, I have drawn close my veil, I have covered my face, and I have sought you there, and have said, Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where you feed your flock, where you make it to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that is veiled beside the flocks of your companions? Yet in spite of your excuses, he will be angry. He will swell with anger and say, If you know not yourself, O you fairest among women, go your way forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed your goats beside the shepherd's tents. You may be fair, and of all faces yours may be dearest to the bridegroom. Yet unless you know yourself, and keep your heart with all diligence, unless you also avoid the eyes of the young men, you will be turned out of my bride chamber to feed the goats, which shall be set on the left hand. These things being so, my Eustochium, daughter, lady, fellow servant, sister, these names refer, the first, to your age, the second, to your rank, the third, to your religious vocation, the last, to the place which you hold in my affection. Hear the words of Isaiah. Come, my people, enter into your chambers and shut your doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation of the Lord be overpassed. Let foolish virgins stray abroad, but for your part stay at home with the bridegroom. For if you shut your door, and, according to the precept of the gospel, pray to your father in secret, he will come and knock, saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. Then straightway you will eagerly reply, It is the voice of my beloved that knocks, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my underfiled. It is impossible that you should refuse, and say, I have put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? Arise immediately, and open. Otherwise, while you linger, he may pass on, and you may have mournfully to say, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had gone. Why need the doors of your heart be closed to the bridegroom? Let them be open to Christ, but closed to the devil, according to the saying, If the spirit of him who has power rise up against you, do not leave your place. Daniel, in that upper story to which he withdrew when he could no longer continue below, had his windows open toward Jerusalem. Do you too keep your windows open, but only on the side where light may enter, 
and from where you may see the eye of the Lord. Do not open those other windows, of which the prophet says, Death has come up into our windows. You must also be careful to avoid the snare of a passion for vain, vainglory. How, Jesus says, can you believe which receive glory one from another? What an evil that must be the victim of which cannot believe. Let us rather say, You are my glorying, and he that glories, let him glory in the Lord, and if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ, and far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified unto me and I unto the world. And once more, in God we boast all the day long. My soul shall make her boast to the Lord. When you do alms, let God alone see you. When you fast, be of a cheerful countenance. Let your dress be neither too neat nor too slovenly. Neither let it be so remarkable as to draw the attention of passers-by and to make men point their fingers at you. Is a brother dead? Has the body of a sister to be carried to its burial? Take care, lest in too often performing such offices you die yourself. Do not wish to seem very devout, nor more humble than need be, lest you seek glory by shunning it. For many who screen from all men's sight their poverty, cha charity, and fasting desire to excite admiration by their very disdain of admiration, and strangely seek for praise while they profess to keep out of its way. From the other disturbing influences which make men rejoice, despond, hope, and fear, I find many free. But this is a defect which few are without, and he is best whose character, like a fair skin, is disfigured by the fewest blemishes. I do not think it necessary to warn you against boasting of your riches, or priding yourself on your birth, or setting yourself up as superior to others. I know your humility. I know that you can say with sincerity, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. I know that in your breast, as in that of your mother, the pride through which the devil fell has no place. It would be time wasted to write to you about it, for there is no greater folly than to teach a pupil what he knows already. But now that you have despised the boastfulness of the world, do not let the fact inspire you with a new boastfulness. Harbor not the secret thought that, having ceased to court attention in garments of gold, you may begin to do so in mean attire. And when you come into a room full of brothers and sisters, do not sit in too low a place, or plead that you are unworthy of a footstool. Do not deliberately lower your voice as though worn out with fasting, nor, leaning on the shoulder of another, mimic the tottering gait of one who is faint. Some women, it is true, disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. As soon as they catch sight of any one, they groan, they look down, they cover up their faces all but one eye, which they keep free to see with. Their dress is somber, their girdles are of sackcloth, their hands and feet are dirty. Only their stomachs, which cannot be seen, are hot food. Of these the psalm is sung daily, The Lord will scatter the bones of them that please themselves. Others change their garb and assume the mien of men, being ashamed of being what they were born to be, women. They cut off their hair and are not ashamed to look like eunuchs. Some clothe themselves in goat's hair, and putting on hoods, think to become children again, 
by making themselves look like so many owls. But I will not speak only of women. Avoid men also when you see them loaded with chains and wearing their hair long like women, contrary to the Apostle's precept. Not to speak of beards like those of goats, black cloaks, and bare feet braving the cold. All these things are tokens of the devil. Such a one Rome groaned over some time back in Antimus, and Sophronius is a still more recent instance. Such persons, when they have once gained admission to the houses of the highborn, and have deceived silly women laden with sins, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, Feign a sad mien, and pretend to make long fasts, while at night they feast in secret. Shame forbids me to say more, for my language might appear more like invective than admonition. There are others, I speak of those of my own order, who seek the presbyterate and the diaconate simply that they may be able to see women with less restraint. Such men think of nothing but their dress. They use perfumes freely and see that there are no creases in their leather shoes. Their curling hair shows traces of the curling tongs. Their fingers glisten with rings. They walk on tiptoe across a damp road not to splash their feet. When you see men acting in this way, think of them rather as bridegrooms than clergymen. Certain persons have devoted the whole of their energies and life to the single object of knowing the names, houses, and characters of married ladies. I will here briefly describe the head of the profession, that from the master's likeness you may recognize the disciples. He rises and goes forth with the sun. He has the order of his visits duly arranged. He takes the shortest road. And, troublesome old man that he is, he forces his way almost into the bedchambers of ladies yet asleep. If he sees a pillow that takes his fancy, or an elegant tablecloth, or indeed any article of household furniture, he praises it, looks admiringly at it, takes it into his hand, and, complaining that he has nothing of the kind, begs, or rather, extorts it from the owner. All the women, in fact, fear to cross the news carrier of the town. Chastity and fasting are alike distasteful to him. What he likes is a savory breakfast, say off a plump young crane, such as commonly is called a cheaper. In speech he is rude and forward, and is always ready to bandy reproaches. Wherever you turn, he is the first man that you see before you. Whatever news is noised abroad, he is either the originator of the rumor or its magnifier. He changes his horses every hour, and they are so sleek and spirited that you would take him for a brother of the Thracian king. Many are the stratagems which the wily enemy employs against us. The serpent, we are told, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the apostle says, We are not ignorant of his devices. Neither an affected shabbiness nor a stylish smartness becomes a Christian. If there is anything of which you are ignorant, if you have any doubt about Scripture, Ask one whose life commends him, whose age puts him above suspicion, whose reputation does not belie him. One who may be able to say, I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Or, if there should be none such able to explain, it is better to avoid danger at the price of ignorance than to court it for the sake of learning. 
remember that you walk in the midst of snares, and that many veteran virgins of a chastity never called into question have on the very threshold of death let their crowns fall from their hands. If any of your handmaids share your vocation, do not lift yourself up against them or pride yourself because you are their mistress. You have all chosen one bridegroom. You all sing the same psalms. Together you receive the body of Christ. Why then should your thoughts be different? You must try to win others, and that you may attract the more readily. You must treat the virgins in your train with the greatest respect. If you find one of them weak in the faith, be attentive to her, comfort her, caress her, and make her chastity your treasure. But if a girl pretends to have a vocation simply because she desires to escape from service, read aloud to her the words of the apostle, It is better to marry than to burn. Idle persons and busybodies, whether virgins or widows, such as go from house to house calling on married women and displaying an unblushing effrontery greater than that of a stage parasite, cast from you as you would the plague. For evil communications corrupt good manners, and women like these care for nothing but their lowest appetites. They will often urge you, saying, My dear creature, make the best of your advantages and live while life is yours. And <laughs> surely you are not laying up money for your children. Given to wine and wantonness, they instill all manner of mischief into people's minds and induce even the most austere to indulge in enervating pleasures. And when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having condemnation, because they have rejected their first faith. Do not seek to appear over-eloquent, nor trifle with verse, nor make yourself gay with lyric songs, and do not, out of affectation, follow the sickly taste of married ladies who, now pressing their teeth together, now keeping their lips wide apart, speak with a lisp and purposely clip their words, because they fancy that to pronounce them naturally is a mark of country breathing. Accordingly, they find pleasure in what I may call an adultery of the tongue. For what communion has light with darkness, and what concord has Christ with Belial? How can Horace go with the Psalter, Virgil with the Gospels, Cicero with the Apostle? Is not a brother made to stumble, if he sees you sitting at meat in an idol's temple? Although unto the pure all things are pure, and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, we still ought not to drink the cup of Christ and at the same time the cup of devils. Let me relate to you the story of my own miserable experience. Many years ago, when from the kingdom of heaven's sake I had cut myself off from home, parents, sister, relations, and harder still, from the dainty food to which I had been accustomed, and when I was on my way to Jerusalem to wage my warfare, I still could not bring myself to forgo the library which I had formed for myself at Rome with great care and toil. And so, miserable man that I was, I would fast, only that I might afterwards read Cicero. After many nights spent in vigil, after floods of tears called from my inmost heart, after the recollection of my past sins, I would once more take up Plautus. And when at times I returned to my right mind and began to read the prophets, their style seemed rude and repellent. I failed to see the light with my blinded eyes, but I attributed the fault not to them but to the sun. 
While the old serpent was thus making me his plaything, about the middle of Lent a deep-seated fever fell upon my weakened body, and while it destroyed my rest completely, the story seems hardly credible, it so wasted my unhappy frame that scarcely anything was left of me but skin and bones. Meantime, preparations for my funeral went on. My body grew gradually colder, and the warmth of life lingered only in my throbbing breast. Suddenly I was caught up in the spirit and dragged before the judgment seat of the judge. And here the light was so bright, and those who stood around were so radiant, that I cast myself upon the ground and did not dare look up. Asked who and what I was, I replied, I am a Christian. But he who presided said, You lie. You are a follower of Cicero and not of Christ. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Instantly I became mute, and amid the strokes of the lash, for he had ordered me to be scourged, I was tortured still more severely by the fire of conscience, considering with myself that verse, In the grave, who shall give you thanks? Yet for all that, I began to cry and to bewail myself, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord! Have mercy on me! Amid the sound of the scourges, this cry still made itself heard. At last the bystanders, falling down before the knees of him who presided, prayed that he would have pity on my youth, and that he would give me space to repent of my error. He might still, they urged, inflict torture on me, should I ever again read the works of the Gentiles. Under the stress of that awful moment, I should have been ready to make even still larger promises than these. Accordingly, I took oath and called upon his name, saying, Lord, if ever again I possess worldly books, or if ever again I read such, I have denied you. Dismissed then, on taking this oath, I returned to the upper world, and to the surprise of all, I opened upon them eyes so drenched with tears that my distress served to convince even the incredulous and that this was no sleep nor idle dream such as those by which we are often mocked. I called a witness the tribunal before which I lay and the terrible judgment which I feared. May it never hereafter be my lot to fall under such an inquisition. I profess that my shoulders were black and blue, that I felt the bruises long after I awoke from my sleep, and that henceforth I read the books of God with a zeal greater than I had previously given to the books of men. End of Part 3 of Letter 22 by St. Jerome Letter 22 to Eustochium by St. Jerome Part 4 You must also avoid the sin of covetousness, and this not merely by refusing to seize upon what belongs to others, for that is punished by the laws of the state, but also by not keeping your own property, which has now become no longer yours. If you have not been faithful, the Lord says, in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? That which is another man's? is a quantity of gold or silver, while that which is our own is the spiritual heritage of which it is elsewhere said, The ransom for a man's life is his riches. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon riches, that is, for in the heathen tongue of the Syrians, riches are called mammon. The thorns which choke our faith 
are the taking thought for our life. Care for the things which the Gentiles seek after is the root of covetousness. But you will say, I am a girl delicately reared, and I cannot labor with my hands. Suppose I live to old age and then fall sick. Who will take pity on me? Hear Jesus speaking to the apostles. Take no thought what you shall eat, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Should clothing fail you, set the lilies of the field before your eyes. Should hunger seize you, think of the words in which the poor and hungry are blessed. Should pain afflict you, read, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, and there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Rejoice in God's judgments. For does not the psalmist say, The daughters of Judah rejoiced because of your judgments, O Lord? Let the words ever be on your lips. Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. And we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Today you may see women cramming their wardrobes with dresses, changing their gowns from day to day, and for all that, unable to vanquish the moths. Now and then, one more scrupulous wears out a single dress. Yet while she appears in rags, her boxes are full. Parchments are dyed purple. Gold is melted into lettering. Manuscripts are decked with jewels. While Christ lies at their door naked and dying. When they do hold out a hand to the needy, they sound a trumpet. When they invite to a love feast, they engage a crier. I lately saw the noblest lady in Rome, I suppress her name, for I am no satirist, with a band of eunuchs before her in the Basilica of the Blessed Peter. She was giving money to the poor, one coin apiece, and this with her own hand, that she might be accounted more religious. Hereupon, a by no means common incident occurred. An old woman, full of years and rags, ran forward to get a second coin, but when her turn came she received not a penny, but a blow hard enough to draw blood from her guilty veins. The love of money is the root of all evil. And the Apostle speaks of covetousness as being idolatry. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Lord will never allow a righteous soul to perish of hunger. I have been young, the psalmist says, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Elijah is fed by ministering ravens. The widow of Zarephath, who, with her sons, expected to die the same night, went without food herself that she might feed the prophet. He who had come to be fed then turned feeder, for by a miracle he filled the empty barrel. The Apostle Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. But now many, while they do not say it in words, declare by their deeds, Faith and pity have I none, but such as I have, silver and gold, these I will not give you. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Hear the prayer of Jacob, If God will be with me, 
and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on? Then shall the Lord be my God. He prayed only for necessary things. Yet twenty years afterward he returned to the land of Canaan, rich in substance and richer still in children. Numberless are the instances in Scripture which teach men to beware of covetousness. As I have been led to touch on the subject, it shall have a treatise to itself, if Christ permits, I will relate what took place not very many years ago at Nitria. A brother more thrifty than covetous, and ignorant that the Lord had been sold for thirty pieces of silver, left behind him at his death a hundred pieces of money which he had earned by weaving linen. As there were about five thousand monks in the neighborhood, living in as many separate cells, a council was held as to what should be done. Some said the coins should be distributed among the poor, others that they should be given to the church, while others were for sending them back to the relatives of the deceased. However, Macarius, Pombo, Isidore, and the rest of those called fathers, speaking by the Spirit, decided that they should be interred with their owner, with the words, Your money perish with you. Nor was this too harsh a decision, for so great a fear has fallen upon all throughout Egypt that it is now a crime to leave after one a single shilling. As I have mentioned the monks, and know that you like to hear about holy things, lend an ear to me for a few minutes. There are in Egypt three classes of monks. First there are the Cenobites, called in their Gentile language, Sauces, or as we should say, men living in a community. Secondly, there are the Anchorites, who live in the desert, each man by himself and are so called because they have withdrawn from human society. Thirdly, there are the class called Remoboth, a very inferior and little regarded type, peculiar to my own province, or at least originating there. They live together in twos and threes, but seldom in larger numbers, and are bound by no rule, but do exactly as they choose. A portion of their earnings they just contribute to a common fund out of which food is provided for all. In most cases they reside in cities and strongholds, and as though it were their workmanship which is holy and not their life, all that they sell is extremely expensive. They often quarrel because they are unwilling, while supplying their own food, to be subordinate to others. It is true that they do compete with each other in fasting. They make what should be a private concern an occasion for triumph. In everything they study the effect. Their sleeves are loose, their boots bulge, their garb is of the coarsest. They are always sighing, or visiting virgins, or sneering at the clergy. Yet. When a holiday comes, they make themselves sick they eat so much. Having then rid ourselves of these, as of so many plagues, let us come to that more numerous class who live together, and who are, as we have said, called Cenobites. Among these, the first principle of union is to obey superiors and do whatever they command. They are divided into bodies of ten and of a hundred, so that each tenth man has authority over nine others, while the hundredth has ten of these officers under him. They live apart from each other in separate cells. According to their rule, no monk may visit another before the ninth hour, except the deans above mentioned, whose office is to comfort with soothing words those whose thoughts disquiet them. After the ninth hour, they meet together to sing psalms and read the scriptures, according to usage. Then, when the prayers have ended and all have sat down, 
one called the Father, stands up among them and begins to expound the portion of the day. While he is speaking, the silence is profound. No man ventures to look at his neighbor or to clear his throat. The speaker's praise is in the weeping of his hearers. Silent tears roll down their cheeks, but not a sob escapes from their lips. Yet when he begins to speak of Christ's kingdom, and of future bliss, and of the glory which is to come, every one may be noticed saying to himself with a gentle sigh and uplifted eyes, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. After this, the meeting breaks up, and each company of ten goes with its father to its own table. This they take in turns to serve, each for a week at a time. No noise is made over the food. No one talks while eating. Bread, pulse, and greens form their fare, and the only seasoning they use is salt. Wine is given only to the old, who, with the children, often have a special meal prepared for them to repair the ravages of age and to save the young from premature decay. When the meal is over, they all rise together and, after singing a hymn, return to their dwellings. There each one talks till evening with his comrade thus. Have you noticed so-and-so? What grace he has! How silent he is! How soberly he walks! If any one is weak, they comfort him. Or if he is fervent in love of God, they encourage him to fresh earnestness. And because at night, besides the public prayers, each man keeps vigil in his own chamber, they go round all the cells one by one, and putting their ears to the doors, carefully ascertain what their occupants are doing. If they find a monk slothful, they do not scold him, but, dissembling what they know, they visit him more frequently, and at first exhort, rather than compel him, to pray more. Each day has its allotted task, and this being given in to the dean is by him brought to the steward. This latter, once a month, gives a scrupulous account to their common father. He also tastes the dishes when they are cooked, and, as no one is allowed to say, I am without a tunic or a cloak or a couch of rushes. He so arranges that no one need ask for or go without what he wants. In case a monk falls ill, he is moved to a more spacious chamber, and there so attentively nursed by the old men that he misses neither the luxury of cities nor a mother's kindness. Every Lord's Day they spend their whole time in prayer and reading. Indeed, whenever they have finished their tasks, these are their usual occupations. Every day they learn by heart a portion of Scripture. They keep the same fasts all the year round, but in Lent they are allowed to live more strictly. After Pentecost, they exchange their evening meal for a midday one, both to satisfy the tradition of the church and to avoid overloading their stomachs with a double supply of food. A similar description is given of the Essenes by Philo, Plato's imitator, also by Josephus, the Greek Livy, in his narrative of the Jewish captivity. As my present subject is virgins, I have said rather too much about monks. I will pass on, therefore, to the third class, called anchorites, who go from the monasteries into the deserts with nothing but bread and salt. Paul introduced this way of life. Anthony made it famous. And to go back farther still, John the Baptist set the first example of it. The prophet Jeremiah describes one such in the words, It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. He sits alone and keeps silence because he has borne it upon him. He gives his cheek 
to him that smites him. He is filled full with reproach, for the Lord will not cast off forever. The struggle of the anchorites and their life, in the flesh, yet not of the flesh, I will, if you wish, explain to you at some other time. I must now return to the subject of covetousness, which I left to speak of the monks. With them before your eyes you will despise not only gold and silver in general, but earth itself and heaven. United to Christ you will sing, The Lord is my portion. End of Part 4 of Letter 22 Letter 22 to Eustochium by St. Jerome Part 5 Farther, although the Apostle bids us to pray without ceasing, and although to the saints their very sleep is a supplication, we ought to have fixed hours of prayer, so that if we are detained by work, the time may remind us of our duty. Prayers, as everyone knows, ought to be said at the third, sixth, and ninth hours, at dawn and at evening. No meal should be begun without prayer, and before leaving table, thanks should be returned to the Creator. We should rise two or three times in the night and go over the parts of the Scripture which we know by heart. When we leave the roof which shelters us, prayer should be our armor, and when we return from the street, we should pray before we sit down, and not give the frail body rest until the soul is fed. In every act we do, in every step we take, let our hand trace the Lord's cross. Speak against nobody, and do not slander your mother's son. Who are you that judges the servant of another? To his own Lord he stands or falls. Yes, he shall be made to stand, for the Lord has power to make him stand. If you have fasted two or three days, do not think yourself better than others who do not fast. You fast and are angry. Another eats and wears a smiling face. You work off your irritation and hunger in quarrels. He uses food in moderation and gives God thanks. Daily Isaiah cries, Is it such a fast that I have chosen, says the Lord? And again, In the day of your fast you find your own pleasure and oppress all your laborers. Behold, you fast for strife and contention and to smite with the fist of wickedness. How do you fast to me? What kind of fast can his be, whose wrath is such that not only does the night go down upon it, but that even the moon's changes leave it unchanged? Look to yourself, and glory in your own success, and not in others' failures. Some women care for the flesh, and reckon up their income and daily expenditure, such are no fit models for you. Judas was a traitor, but the eleven apostles did not waver. Phygelus and Alexander made shipwreck, but the rest continued to run the race of faith. Do not say, well, so-and-so enjoys her own property. She is honored by men. Her brothers and sisters come to see her. Has she then ceased to be a virgin? Well, in the first place, it is doubtful whether she is a virgin. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. <laughs> Again, she may be a virgin in body, but not in spirit. According to the Apostle, a true virgin is holy both in body and in spirit. Lastly, let her glory in her own way. Let her override Paul's opinion and live in the enjoyment of her good things. But you and I must follow better examples. Set before you the blessed Mary. 
whose surpassing purity made her fitting to be mother of the Lord. When the angel Gabriel came down to her in the form of a man and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. She was terror-stricken and unable to reply, for she had never been greeted by a man before. But on learning who he was, she spoke, and one who had been afraid of a man conversed fearlessly with an angel. Now you too may be the Lord's mother. Take you a great roll and write in it with a man's pen, Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And when you have gone to the prophetess, and have conceived in the womb, and have brought forth a son, say, Lord, we have been with child by your fear. We have been in pain. We have brought forth the spirit of your salvation, which we have wrought upon the earth. Then shall your son reply, Behold, my mother and my brothers. And he whose name you have so recently inscribed upon the table of your heart, and have written with a pen upon its renewed surface, he, after he has recovered the spoil from the enemy, and has spoiled principalities and powers, nailing them to his cross, having been miraculously conceived, he grows up to manhood, and as he becomes older, regards you no longer as his mother, but as his bride. To be as the martyrs, or as the apostles, or as Christ, involves a hard struggle, but brings with it a great reward. All such efforts are only of use when they are made within the church's boundaries. We must celebrate the Passover in one house. We must enter the ark with Noah. We must take refuge from the fall of Jericho with the justified harlot Rahab. Such virgins as there are said to be among the heretics and among the followers of the infamous Manes must be considered not virgins but prostitutes. For if, as they allege, the devil is the author of the body, how can they honor that which is fashioned by their foe? No, it is because they know that the name virgin brings glory with it, that they go about like wolves in sheep's clothing. As Antichrist pretends to be Christ, such virgins assume an honorable name, that they may the better cloak a discreditable life. Rejoice, my sister, rejoice, my daughter, rejoice, my virgin, for you have resolved to be in reality that which others insincerely feign. The things that I have here set forth will seem hard to her who does not love Christ, but one who has come to regard all the splendor of the world as off-scourings, and to hold all things under the sun as empty, that he may win Christ. One who has died with his Lord and risen again, and has crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts, she will boldly cry out, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? And again, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For our salvation, the Son of God is made the Son of Man. Nine months he awaits his birth in the womb, undergoes the most revolting conditions, and comes forth covered in blood, to be swathed in rags and covered with caresses. He who shuts up the world in his fist 
is contained in the narrow limits of a feed box. I say nothing of the thirty years during which he lives in obscurity, satisfied with the poverty of his parents. When he is scourged, he holds his peace. When he is crucified, he prays for his crucifiers. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The only fitting return that we can make to him is to give blood for blood. And as we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, gladly to lay down our lives for our Redeemer. What saint has ever won his crown without first contending for it? Righteous Abel is murdered. Abraham is in danger of losing his wife. And, as I must not enlarge my book unduly, look for yourself. You will find that all holy men have suffered adversity. Solomon alone lived in luxury, and perhaps it was for this reason that he fell. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. Which is best, to do battle for a short time, to carry stakes for the palisades, to bear arms, to faint under heavy shields, that ever afterwards we may rejoice as victors? Or to become slaves forever, just because we cannot endure for a single hour? Love finds nothing hard. No task is difficult to the eager. Think of all that Jacob bore for Rachel, the wife who had been promised to him. Jacob, Scripture says, served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love he had to her. Afterwards, he himself tells us what he had to undergo. In the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night. So we must love Christ and always seek his embraces. Then everything difficult will seem easy. All long things we shall account short. And struck with his arrows, we shall say every moment, Woe is me that I have prolonged my pilgrimage. For the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope does not make ashamed. When your lot seems hard to bear, read Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. I have been in the deep a night and a day. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils by the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Which of us can claim the veriest fraction of the virtues here enumerated? Yet it was these which afterwards made him bold to say, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. But we, if our food is less appetizing than usual, get sullen 
and fancy that we do God a favor by drinking watered wine. And if the water brought to us is a trifle too warm, we break the cup and overturn the table and scourge the slave in fault until blood comes. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. <laughs> Still, unless you use force, you will never grab the kingdom of heaven. Unless you knock importunately, you will never receive the sacramental bread. Is it not truly violence, think you, when the flesh desires to be like God and ascends to the place from which angels have fallen to judge angels? <sighs> Emerge, I pray you, for a while from your prison house and paint before your eyes the reward of your present toil a reward which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. What will be the glory of that day, when Mary, the mother of the Lord, shall come to meet you, accompanied by her virgin choirs? When the Red Sea passed and Pharaoh drowned with his host, Miriam, Aaron's sister, her timbrel in her hand, shall chant to the answering women, Sing ye unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. Then shall Thecla fly with joy to embrace you. Then shall your spouse himself come forward and say, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. Then shall the angels say with wonder, Who is she that looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun? The daughters shall see you and bless you, yea, the queens shall proclaim, and the concubines shall praise you. And after these, yet another company of chaste women will meet you. Sarah will come with the wedded, Anna daughter of Phanuel, with the widows. In the one band you will find your natural mother, and in the other your spiritual. The one will rejoice in having borne you, the other will exult in having taught you. Then truly will the Lord ride upon his donkey, and thus enter the heavenly Jerusalem. Then the little ones, of whom in Isaiah the Savior says, Behold, I am the children whom the Lord has given me, shall lift up palms of victory, and shall sing with one voice, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! Then shall the hundred and forty and four thousand hold their harps before the throne and before the elders, and shall sing the new song. And no man shall have power to learn that song, except for those for whom it is appointed. These are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are those which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. As often as this life's idle show tries to charm you, as often as you see in the world some vain pomp, transport yourself in mind to paradise. Assay to be now what you will be hereafter. And you will hear your spouse say, Set me as a shade in your heart and as a seal upon your arm. And then, strengthened in body as well as in mind, you too will cry aloud and say, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. End of Part 5 of Letter 22 End of Letter 22 by St. Jerome